Okay. I am Madeline Brown. I met Lyndon Johnson in 1948 and had a 21-year relationship with him. I had a son by him, Stephen Brown, that passed away be 10 years this month. Um, we had a beautiful relationship, and even today, as I talk about him, my toenails still turn up. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Oh, where do you want me to go from here? <laughs> uh, well, tell me a little bit about uh, your uh, your family history a little bit. Oh, my family? Yeah. I was raised or reared by the most wonderful parents that anyone could have. They were really orthodox Christians, and they lived totally by the Ten Commandments. They were, uh, I'm sure my father gave away as much as we had in our home. And even to this day, there's a mission that Mother Teresa established in, let's see, what year was it? And where I, our home, our homeland. And I still support it. Uh, but where I grew up, and I've often said that this mission is, is just a living on of what my father what he did in the old Trendy Heights area. Okay, uh, now let's talk about uh, the events surrounding uh, John Kennedy's uh, assassination. Uh, what uh, what do you know happened just prior to the uh, assassination? Why don't we go back to 1960 <clears throat> okay. at the con Democrat Convention in California. And this came back first-handed from John Currington that was an aide to H.L. Hunt. Um, when they met in California, Joe Kennedy, John Kennedy's father, and H.L. Hunt met three days prior to the election. Um, they uh, they finally cut a deal, according to John Currington, and H.L. finally agreed that Lyndon would go in the second, or as a vice president. I know there's been lots of talk about this, but this came from the horse's mouth way back in 1960. And when H.L. came back to Dallas, I was walking up uh, Irby Street, which I did almost daily with him, and he made the remark, we may have lost a battle, but we're going to win a war. And then the day of the assassination, he said, well, we won the war. It, it was a total political thing, a political crime. And H.L. Uh, Hunt really controlled what actually happened to John Kennedy, he and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, well, let's talk about the... Uh the planning of the assassination before it happened, uh, didn't it go well, back it, about a year or so before? Oh, it, it, uh, it, it started after the, uh, the convention. H.L. Hunt didn't let it rest. He immediately, they went to mapping a, a plan out of, or a plot, how to get rid of John Kennedy. Uh, they were just in total disgust with John Kennedy. Well, where did they meet to, to hold these discussions? H.L. Uh, Hunt had, of course, property everywhere, but they had this lodge up close to, it was outside of Dallas, and they would meet there, and they uh, he chose different people to, to do certain things for him. And uh, I, I'm sure it went on about two years prior to the assassination of John Kennedy. About where was this lodge? The best I recall, it was north of Dallas, and it was on a, well, it's over by a creek. It was very scenic, and it was very secluded, and you really had to be invited there yeah. because it, you, you wouldn't know how to get there. Did, did you go out there with Hunt? I, I have been there, but uh, it was for a social rather than any planning of the assessment. No, I, I know you were not invited in the planning, but I no. mean socially. Socially, yes. Okay. I'm sure I'm one of the few people in Texas that was socialized with all the high rollers. And again, we called them the 8F group. They, um, it was uh, 
fraternity among these people. Well, let's talk about the 8F group. Uh, what do you mean by 8F? What does that mean? Uh, it was, the best I recall, it was their room number at the Lamar Hotel in Houston. And they would meet there for various things, but mostly for gambling and, and making, cutting business deals. Who were the members of the 8F group? Uh, they had to be the great white fathers of Texas. Primarily it was your your oil people, your your high rollers. Uh, by name, who do you? Oh, there was George and Herman Brown were probably the biggest of all of them. And Hunt, Clint Murkison, Sid Richardson. Uh, again, Hot all Pines. the big... The, the finance, I guess that's what I'm looking for. I mean, for. was Hoffines there? Uh, uh, Judge Hoffines? Judge Hoffines, yes, he was part of that group. Uh, John and Connelly? And occasionally, like, yeah, John Connolly. Occasionally, uh, uh, our FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, would appear there. He hobnobbed with those people, and particularly Clint. That's an uh, interesting subject. Tell me more about the relationship of uh, J. Edgar Hoover and H.L. Hunt and Sid Richardson and Clint Murchison. What, what do you know about uh, that? Well, the first time I met uh, J. Edgar Hoover, I was at the Driscoll Hotel. I had met Lyndon probably six weeks or so before. And we were dancing there in the Driscoll. And uh, I looked up and I saw J. Edgar Hoover and his companion, uh, and Clint was the Sid was Richardson. Yes. Tolson? I beg your pardon? His name Tolson? Yeah. And I remembered from the 30s the G Men series. So I said to Lyndon, I said, Isn't that the G Man? That's what I called him, you know. Yeah. And he said, A little girl shouldn't have such big uh, eyes and no ears. And he said, You forget what you saw. But I met him that night. Yes. Were you around when uh, J. Edgar Hoover was with Hunt or Richardson or Murchison? Or well, they were, they were at the party the night before the assassination. All the high rollers in Texas was at Clint's the night before the assassination. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about that, that meeting at uh, Murchison's house. Uh, when, when did that happen? It was the night before the assassination on Thursday night. That uh, November the 21st, 1963? Yes. Okay. What, about what time did it start? Well, I was called and told me that they were having the social, and of course I was ready to go to any social. I think I must have gotten there around 8, and um, the party was breaking up probably 10, 30, 11, maybe. May, I guess it was 11. And uh, uh, we were all stunned when Lyndon came in. What time did he come in? It must have, well, he came from Houston. It must have been around 11 o'clock. The party was breaking up mm -hmm. at that time. And it, it shocked everyone that uh, he came in. Of course, I was thrilled to see him. Normally, I knew his agenda when he was in Texas. But that night, I did not know that he was coming. And they all went into this conference room. Who called a meeting? Uh, Clint did. Clint? Yeah. He's, what, what did he say? He says, come on, boys, you know. I thought they were going in and gamble because they gamble, yeah. you know, so much. Okay. But the, the meeting didn't last, or Lyndon didn't stay that much in the meeting. And when he came out, he uh, I thought he was going to say something yeah, uh, sweeter. First of all, where, what part of the house was the meeting in? It was in their conference room, and, of course, the home was huge. They yeah. had... Uh, the social was out, well, the best I recall, in the library area. Uh-huh. But he had a conference room? Oh, he had a conference room. They all did. Okay. Now, let's talk about who you know were in that meeting. Well, in, my, in the private meeting. Yeah. One of my very best friends that dates way back to the 40s, a George W. Owens, one of the most colorful persons that anyone could know. And to show you how colorful he was, uh, he would hang around Jack Ruby and he would, uh, the Abe Weinstein was right next door. And George was courting Candy Bar, and I know the name Candy Bar rings a bell. Anyway, when she got, uh, I guess you'd use the word busted, 
for marijuana charge was with her and it caused a big big scandal but from there he uh, of course he played uh, varsity basketball for SMU and there we had Joe Campisi these people are is a real close knitted group yeah. of people so through the years, George identified with Clint Marcus, and he, I don't know how many business is that he uh, he was involved with. And you'd see Clint and Sid, you'd often see George. Well, what was uh, George Owen's job with uh, Clint? With Clint, it was various uh, businesses that they were involved in. There was some building and, and some oil and but George had such a wonderful personality. I can envision him how he got involved with Clint Marcus. And okay, now what what was his involvement with that meeting that night? He was there socially, and and of course Jack Ruby had brought one of the call girls to the meeting. I don't know who was she. The the call girl. Yeah. I've been told her her name was Shirley. I know her. Uh -huh. But she doesn't want to talk about this. Okay. Uh, well, now. I knew the girl. Yeah, but you, you said earlier something about uh, George Owens had picked up somebody at the airport, or. Yeah, he did. The day of on Thursday. Uh -huh. Of course, Dallas didn't have the big metropolitan airport. Right. It was Lovefield, very small. Right. So he went out to Lovefield and he picked up John J. McCloy, and. Uh, Jagger Hoover. Uh, it seems like Pierre Charles Cabell was with that group, the best I remember. Of course, there was a lot of, you know, problems there. Mm -hmm. Who else did uh, George Owens pick up at the airport? The, those are the ones that George said that he uh, recalled picking up and taking them to Clint's. Uh, now, who, who picked up Nixon? Nixon was already in town. Okay. He came in on Tuesday and met with Lyndon that no one knew anything about. Yeah. But Lyndon met Nixon in Dallas on Tuesday. Where did they meet? I'm not sure uh, exactly where their meeting was, but I do know they met. But uh, Nixon was staying where? He was in one of the local hotels, the, the Adolphus, best I recall. Okay.